Dr. Rob Barnfield, Head of Explosives Engineering for EPC UK. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is on using a blasting seismograph. Okay, so what are we going to look at today? Well, we're going to look at what a blasting seismograph is, the three main parts, what we are measuring, and what standards apply. We're going to look at why a blasting seismograph setup is important, because we use it for blast design feedback, we use it for compliance monitoring to make sure or to be able to prove that we're meeting our planning permissions. Then we're going to look at what the best practice is, so what we do in preparation, how we physically set up in the field, what we should do as a monitoring procedure, and we should look at any additional data that we wish to collect. So first of all, what is a blasting seismograph? Well, it's an instrument specifically designed for the, the industries using explosives because we wish to record ground vibration and we wish to record vibration through the air, generally known as air overpressure. And that's from any blasting operation. That can include surface blasting, such as from quarries or civil engineering works, say road cuttings, things like that. But also underground blasting, such as from mines or civil engineering tunneling works. Uh, or even demolition of buildings. So anything using explosives will generally have some form of requirement to record the environmental impact, both ground vibration and air overpressure. So what are the basic components? Well, there are three. Uh, the control unit, uh, generally a computer that's looking for the vibration events, it records and reports them. The triaxial geophone here, which actually senses the ground vibration. And the air overpressure transducer here, which senses the air vibration or air overpressure. There's a bit more detail on the triaxial geophone. Here you see the unit here. It's called triaxial because it's actually measuring in three different directions. So it's looking at the velocity in three directions. So if we have our blast here, here's our geophone. We'll generally see it some kind of line or arrow on top of the geophone, and that is indicating the direction you should line it up with the blast. And that's the radial or longitudinal direction. At right angles to that, also horizontally, is the transverse direction. And then right angles to both of those, up and down, the vertical direction. And you can see in this cutaway of the inside of the geophone, here's the three different geophones, the vertical, transverse, and radial or longitudinal. Is the air overpressure transducer, often referred to as a microphone. I don't like to use the term microphone because that implies it's monitoring audible noise. And a lot of energy in air overpressure is subaudible, i.e. you can't hear it. Uh, so we have to use a special unit, special microphone, special transducer to record those low frequencies. Should also be equipped, as both of these are, with a windshield. Then the control unit, essentially it's a small computer and it controls the monitoring process. So it sits there looking at the geophone and the air overpressure microphone, looking for events, ground vibration and air overpressure events. On detecting an event, it will start the recording process. <coughs> so it's after it's triggered, it's continuing to record until the event is over or for a set period of time, depends upon the setup of the seismograph and the manufacturer. It will then calculate the peak levels for each of the geophone components and the peak air overpressure. Store that data along with the full event recording so that you can upload it to a computer and do some more detailed analysis if you require. You can also then print out the event. It will then return back to the pre-trigger and look for the next vibration event. Worth noting that you, most seismographs these days can also be set up to work in a remote mode so you can put them in a permanent location, permanent installation, and communicate with them via the mobile phone network, or even they may report to an internet site. So what are we monitoring? Well, we're looking for peak ground vibration levels and peak air overpressure levels. The peak ground vibration levels, known generally as peak particle velocity, or more commonly as PPV, uh, and those units are in millimeters per second. We're going to get a PPV for each of those three directional, three directions. So that's vertical, longitudinal, radial, and transverse. 
The peak air overpressure, we will generally see that quoted in pascals or more likely in decibels. So decibels, a little d, big B, and then we should see brackets lin or brackets linear or brackets L. That indicates that it's a special G, um, air overpressure transducer to record low frequencies. It's important that you make sure you're, you're using dB lin. Just to give you some idea of the numbers for human perception, we're talking around about half a millimeter per second, so humans are quite susceptible to vibration. The typical planning constraint we may see would be six millimeters per second, so we're aiming to get most blasts under six. Generally, a planning permission for the absolute maximum would be set to 12. And the, and the level that you're likely to start the possibility of getting structural damage is 15. That's what the British standard will tell us. It doesn't mean to say you'll get damage at 15, but that's the lowest level ever been recorded. In terms of air overpressure, if you go outside and record background levels, you'll get around about 100 dB linear. Um, a widely recognized limit would be 140 dB linear. Window breakage will happen at 171, so you can expect all windows to break at 171 decibels. You start to get structural damage at around about 180 decibels. Most blasts, in terms of ground vibration, most quarries would generally expect to get around one, two, three millimeters, four millimeters, those kind of numbers. And the typical levels for um, air overpressure would be 110, 115, 120, 125 decibels, those kind of numbers. So there are some standards we need to be aware of. There are British and international standards that cover the use of seismographs for monitoring ground vibration, but there's no standard for covering air overpressure. So we have a British standard, 4866, which is also an international standard, and that was compiled in 2010. And it covers the requirements for monitoring of ground vibration and it specifically lists blasting operations in that standard. They have two classes of instrument, one for research and one that we would normally use would be referred to as a class two instrument for vibration field recording. And it says it should be able to record in the frequency range of two to 80 hertz. And we should have a digital sampling rate of at least a thousand samples per second, i.e. one kilohertz. Now we tend to use the International Society of Explosives Engineers performance specification for blasting seismographs because that matches the British standard and betters it and it also includes air overpressure. And that was last updated in 2017. It also requires a geophone frequency response of 2 to 250 hertz but also applies that to the, the air overpressure transducer 2 to 250 hertz and it requires a minimal sampling rate of 1 kilohertz. So if you're buying a seismograph, you should really ask the supplier, does your seismograph match the ISEE performance specification? Seismographs should generally also be calibrated. There's no standard about how often this should be done, but most people apply common sense and will calibrate their seismographs every 12 months. And that's what's recommended by the ISEE. And the copy of the calibration certificate should accompany any seismograph. In the calibration process, it will be put on a shaking table, in this case on the top here for vertical vibration. That could be rotated round and the seismograph placed on here for horizontal calibration. The calibration process will check that vibration uh, recording against a standard that can be traceable back to a, a national standard. So what, why are we monitoring? It's a good question when we're going out monitoring. Well, there's a number of reasons we might be monitoring because it is a planning requirement. Most, ski, most sites that are using explosives will have a scheme of vibration monitoring. And that will often state that the vibration from every blast should be monitored at the nearest occupied property. We may be doing it for public relations. Commonly, if someone complains about blasting, we will say to that person for the next blast, we will come to your property and do some recording. So that's really about communication. You're talking to the person, reassuring the person, showing them that you care, uh, and showing them that you are recording vibration data. More importantly for us, actually, is that we may use vibration recordings as part of the blast design process. So we're taking our recordings, putting it back to a into a database, and then using it to design the next blast. 
So if we get the vibration recording wrong, then our blast design process is going to be wrong. Now, equally importantly, we may need to be able to demonstrate our compliance to the planning permission. So we'll have, any site using explosives these days will have planning conditions relating to ground vibration. We need to be able to demonstrate that compliance. Again, if you accidentally get a high reading or you get a high reading, uh, there's no going back. If you've broken the planning permission, you've broken the planning permission. Most sites have to report vibration recordings to the local authority. We have this little saying that we use across the bottom here. It's only possible to accidentally get a high reading, not a low one. So if you do anything wrong, do things incorrectly, the chances are you're going to get a higher reading than the real one. But once you get a high reading, there is no going back. So what do we need to do in preparation before we go out? Make sure you know where you're going, name, address, telephone number, where you're going to be doing the monitoring. Have we got the batteries charged sufficiently to cover the monitoring period? Do we have all the required accessories? So do we have geofoam feet? If you're monitoring on a solid surface, if you're monitoring on soil or grass, do we have soil spikes? Does the air overpressure transducer have a windshield? Then we need to make sure that we've set up the correct monitoring parameters in the control unit. Much better to do that in the office than wait until you're out in the field. So we're thinking of trigger level, recording duration and recording range. More of those in a minute. So here's the monitoring parameters. So the most important one is typically the trigger level. At what vibration level will the seismograph say, there's an event, I'm going to record it. Typically, we will set this to 0.5 millimeters per second, because that's the level of human perception. I would recommend to anybody, set it to half a millimeter per second and leave it there. You can lower the, the trigger level, but you get the risk of false triggers, people walking past you trigger it, traffic, things like that. Or you can raise it, but then you have the risk of not triggering. My bar advice is leave it at half a millimeter per second. It is also possible to set a trigger level for air overpressure. Typically, we would set this to, hey, say, 110 decibels for demolition. For any other activity other than demolition, I would recommend disabling it because we always have the risk of triggers from wind noise. Recording duration. Generally, I would look at the, what's expected in the blast and double it. Uh, now, for coring and civil engineering, you could easily just set to four seconds recording. That would be sufficient. Uh, for big mining blasts and underground operations, you'd need to look at the blast and decide on what the duration is. It's generally going to be longer than four seconds. For a demolition, it's going to be project specific. How long is it going to take the building collapse? What's the advanced initiation system? Things like that. Now, as for the recording range, we used to be able to set that, but most seismographs these days do auto ranging. Uh, but you need to decide, am I expecting a high level, low level, and then set the range accordingly. Just thought I'd show you a few example recordings, just so you can see the difference between the different industries. At the top here, we have a quarry blast. You can see it's relatively short. The vibration level goes on for about a second. So if you reset the sort of recording level to four seconds, you're going to easily capture the whole event. Or demolition, see a very long event starts here and it's going on for nearly five seconds. Very high frequency at the beginning here and then some low frequency at the bottom. I'll explain that a bit more in a second. And a typical underground mining blast or tunneling blast, you can see a whole series of events. Each one of those events corresponds to a delay period in the detonators are being used. Typically you use very long delay periods in those. So it's a completely different looking trace. Just gonna superimpose the air overpressure recording on the ground vibration recordings. You can see for the quarry here, it, it comes quite a long time afterwards, about a second, second and a half after the vibration event. That's because the air overpressure travels through the air slower than the vibration travels through the ground. So the further you get away, the bigger that lag time. But again, it's the, you can see four seconds, you're recording that in there. It's a very typical air overpressure event, very low frequency. This one, a little bit weird. I'll put the air overpressure on, see very high levels at the beginning. That's the initiation system firing. Generally, they use open, uncovered detonating core for the initiation system. In actual fact, the vibration event was the air overpressure hitting the geophone, 
not ground vibration. Then there's a bit of a pause, and then the initiation system fires, the building collapses, and this is the building hitting the floor. So the main vibration event is the building hitting the floor. So where do we locate our geophone? Well, generally, best practice would be to locate it close to the property at foundation level on the side of the property closest to the blast. Now, sometimes you can't get permission to monitor at someone's property or go on their land, so you may need to then go to the nearest public right of way and monitor there. What you should try and avoid the temptation to do is monitor inside of structures. You're only going to get higher readings, and in any case, the planning permission will apply outside of the structure at foundation level. In terms of air overpressure microphone location, that's going to have to be close to the geophone because it's going to be attached to the same piece of equipment. Uh, on a stand, probably 0.2 at least above the ground. And you can orientate it vertically or point it at 45 degrees the direction of the blast. The geophone, those geophones that you, we saw earlier on, the, the vertical and the horizontal ones are of different construction, so it's important that the geophone is reasonably level. So you can put a little bubble level on top and just check that the geophone is level. Geophone mounting, this is a really important part and quite often and commonly done incorrectly, and you will then get a high reading uh, or a higher reading than you needed to. So the mounting technique depends upon the surface in which you're placing it on. It's very important to avoid certain areas, to avoid any loose surfaces, such as recently dug soil, insecure paving stones. In fact, I would recommend not using paving stones. Uh, and make sure you look around the area, but make sure you're not going to be monitoring over the top of subsurface structures, such as, such as septic tanks. So look around, see if you can see any uh, inspection hatches for tanks and things like that, and avoid those areas. So you see this picture here, here we are monitoring on paving slabs and they could easily be loose. They don't need to be very loose to give you a much higher reading. So try and avoid the monitoring on paving stones. So mounting geophones on solid surfaces, we have three options. We can place, we can place with a sandbag or we can bolt or glue. So placement, simply placing the geophone on the surface, make sure it's level. You can do that, but you need to do it with care. Make sure that this thing is not going to wobble. Uh, best practice is to place and then put a sandbag over the top. Uh, just worth noting, it's a fairly loosely filled large bag and it touches the ground all the way around the geophone. Uh, the best way for all levels is actually to bolt or glue. Um, unfortunately, uh, that's not really that popular with the public who go along and start gluing things down to their property or drilling holes in the floor so generally we can't do that but we would do this very commonly for other other structures such as close to railway lines on engineering structures waterworks things like that or we quite often would do this for a permanent monitoring system this is an example of good practice we're going to talk about soil spiking in a second here we have a geophone on a concrete base, a U-shaped bracket over the top and it's screwed down along the top. So you slip the geophone in, screw it in. In this case, on a concrete base again, with a large bag of fine material placed over the top. We did do an experiment just to demonstrate the effect of poor monitoring technique. So we have two sides of a glass, identical, set next to each other. One here, the geophone is leveled. Uh, the feet in the bottom of the geophone are tightened up and then we have a sandbag over the top. This one here, it's not sandbagged, it is leveled, but the feet underneath the, the securing bolts are not tightened up, so the feet are loose. So first of all, we'll look at the recording for that one in the horizontal transverse, that's in this direction at right angles to the orientation of the photograph. Here we have the reading. And then for the same geophone from that one, that's the blue reading. So you see massive difference between the two. In fact, if you look at the PPVs, uh, the badly mounted one is 12.4, the properly mounted one is 5.8. So in actual fact, for most planning permissions, you'd have broken the absolute limit, apparently, with the red one, and you'd be below the 95% limit with the blue one. 
So one, you're in full compliance with the plan of mission. The other one, you're in full non-compliance with the plan of mission, all from the way the geophone is mounted. So really, please pay attention to the way you do this. If you're mounting uh, monitoring on grass or soil, uh, it's a good idea actually to a uh, well-established lawn, or hard packed soil, just avoid areas that have been dug over or plowed. If that's unavoidable, then you need to dig down into the soil until you got to a compacted surface. We use these soil spikes, um, so quite long spikes. Uh, we can push those into the ground. But if you don't have that as an option on your geophone, you should not monitor on soil or grass. So ordinary short legs don't monitor on grass. It's just going to wobble. You'll get a high reading. So make sure you use the right number of spikes for your geophone and that they're tightly screwed in. And when you push that into the ground, make sure that it's fully pushed in so there's no gap between the bottom of the geophone and the soil, so it doesn't have an option to, to move. Now, what about your monitoring procedure? Well, allow plenty of time. You don't want to be going out to monitor at the last possible minute, the siren's going, you rush it, and then that's when you make mistakes and you get an un unfortunately high reading. No going back with a high reading. So make sure you continue to record until you hear the all clear signal or you're told by the shop file or the explosive supervisor that the blasting is complete. It's a good idea to take a picture of the monitoring location, so like I've done in the bottom here. Now that will be date and time stamped so you can prove at least you were there. It's best practice to use standard monitoring locations with known survey coordinates that you can go back to time and time again. What additional data do you need to collect? Well, I like to keep a date and time, so take a note of that. Take a note of the basic weather conditions. You're gonna need blast information, so the location of the blast, so the coordinates and the level in the middle of the blast. That can be done with a handheld GPS, but generally these days we will have surveyed it in any case. You can get that information from the blasting specification. And we will need the maximum instantaneous charge rate. You get that from the blasting spec, get it from the shot fire. We need monitoring location information, description of name, where were we? And also we need, again, the same survey information for the monitoring point. Without that information and that survey information, the data is really useless to us when it comes to blast design feedback. We need a summary of the results. We need PBBs from all three directions. And you'll see a, a fourth one reported by seismographs, which is either known as the resultant or the maximum vector sum. So there's four PBBs to write down. And then we need the peak air over pressure level as well. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that webinar and you found it useful. Your feedback is really important to us. So when you leave this webinar, you'll get the option of going to another website to answer simple feedback questions. Alternatively, you can email us with any comments on the address shown here. And just to remind you that these webinars are Institute Acquiring Accredited for CPD. So you can log the time you've spent watching this webinar uh, and note that it's accredited. Uh, and just to note that we're also doing webinar based training. So our usual suite of courses are now being given via webinars and in some cases also along with classroom training. So that's explosive awareness, shot firing under the quarries regulation and shot firings under the mines regulation. So again, any information you want on that, you can visit our website and look at the courses. Or again, you can contact us on this email address here, learning at epc-group.co.uk. So I hope you've enjoyed this and it's been useful to you. Thank you.